Welcome to this video series on clinical examination brought to you by the Department of Clinical Medicine at the Faculty of Medicine, Colombo. Now, our objective in producing this series is to give you an overview of the correct technique of the clinical examination, at the same time pointing out some of the common mistakes made by the students. In this step, we deal with the respiratory system. I thank Ajit, who is here today, for volunteering for this program. Traditionally, we perform the clinical examination first by doing a relevant clinical examination of the general body, then proceeding to examine the neck and the thorax. You should examine, you should begin the examination as you approach the patient. Stand back and use your wide angle lens. You might observe whether the patient is comfortable, whether he can lie comfortably on bed without becoming dyspneic. Has he lost weight recently? Any sign of any signs of cachexia might indicate possible tuberculosis or carcinoma. As you approach this patient, look at his face. Look at the conjunctive. Is there any evidence of polycythemia or anemia? Look at the lips and the tongue. Do you put that is there any evidence of cyanosis? The beefy red tongue of uh, polycythemia with central cyanosis is characteristic. Look for any evidence of facial edema, any swelling in the face and the neck that might indicate presence of either co-pulmonary or SVC obstruction. Patient's hands give us very valuable information. Look at the nails. Now, are there any nicotine stains? That might indicate the patient is a smoker. Look for clubbing. Clubbing is one of the very important physical signs in the respiratory system. So pick your uh, patient's hands to eye level and look at the angle between the nail bed and the nail. One of the earliest manifestations of a clubbing is the obliteration of this angle. Later on, this can progress into increased curvature of the nail. Later on, going into gross clubbing, which involves the whole pulp. Sometimes it's associated with changes in the wrist joint, hypertrophic pulmonary osteoarthropathy. If the patient is hypoxic and cyanosed, you might look for any evidence of carbon dioxide retention. He will have a bounding pulse, warm hands, and a flapping tremors. Then proceed to look at patient's feet. Of course, you might notice clubbing in the toes, but the important thing is to look for any evidence of fluid retention, pitting edema in the patient's feet. Presence of pitting edema, fluid retention, in a patient with a respiratory problem might indicate either core pulmonary. Once you finish the general examination, you proceed to the examination of the neck and the chest. This we do in four steps. Inspection, palpation, percussion, and auscultation. Let's start the inspection by first looking at the patient's neck. There are many things again you might observe with the neck. You look for any scars, barbs, scars, any lumps, perhaps lymph node masses. Look for the use of the accessory muscles which might indicate that there is the patient is in some respiratory embarrassment. Usually, between the suprasternal notch and the cricoid, you can insert about three fingers. But 
when there is hyperinflation of the chest like in the chronic asthmatic or chronic obstructive airway disease this distance is greatly reduced look at the chest look at the skin are there any distended veins distended veins in the neck in the chest coupled with engorged veins in the neck particularly if they are non pulsating might indicate the presence of SVC obstruction distended neck veins with prominent A wave suggest the presence of corpulmonary look for any radiotherapy marks on the chest sometimes there may be small telangiac TC as a result of radiotherapy look for thoracotomy scars and look for any suprasternal and uh, supraclavicular intercostal and subcostal recession this again indicates that the presence of very high pressure waves or pressure gradients inside the pleural cavity particularly in case of chronic obstructive airway disease chest shape is also important there may be certain skeletal deformities pectus carinatum pectus excavatum and in case of long standing obstructive airway disease barrel shaped chest or increase in the anterior posterior diameter. Sometimes students often forget to examine the back. Put a kit again. Look at the back. Run your finger down the spine and look for a kyphoscoliosis. Take a side view and estimate what the anterior posterior diameter is. To judge whether there is barrel shaped chest this is the best way next we look at the respiration or the breathing movements and for this we use a tape measure you measure at the level of the nipples and ask the patient to take deep breaths in and out You also should look at the type of the breathing, whether there is a thoracoabdominal, and also take this opportunity to, to count the respiratory rate. When you count the respiratory rate, make sure that the patient is not aware that you are counting the respiration. Next, you compare the size, the symmetry of the movements, which is a very important step at this point, because if the movements are reduced on one side, then that indicates that there is some problem on that side. For this purpose, you take a step back. Take a tangential view of the chest and ask the patient to take one or two good deep breaths. Next, we proceed to the second step of the examination, namely palpation. We begin by palpating the neck. When you palpate the neck, you should do that from the front as well as from the back. You look for the lymph nodes, you get the patient to relax the neck, put the, uh, flex the neck a little, and then feel all the lymph node areas. submandibular, submental, along the carotid sheath, as well as supraclavicular and the scalene node. The best position to palpate the neck is from behind. Pay particular attention to the supraclavicular nodes, as well as the scalene node. 
the enlargement of these lymph nodes might indicate the presence of carcinoma or tuberculosis. Another important structure in the neck that you should feel at this stage is the position of the trachea. There are many ways of doing that. One way is to follow the trachea with your index finger and then assess whether the trachea deviates to the right side or to the left side. But remember that this is little uncomfortable. So always tell the patient, explain to the patient that this procedure may be little uncomfortable as you will be feeling deep. The second method of palpation for the trachea is to assess the distance or the gap between the heads of the sternomastoid and the trachea. For this, what you do is you keep one finger on the sternoclavicular head, the other one, the ring finger on the other sternoclavicular head and assess the space between the trachea and the sternoclavicular, sternoclavicular mastoid, uh, the head here. Usually trachea is slightly deviated to the right side. But in case of the gross deviation, you should suspect fibrosis or lung collapse where it is deviated to the same side or pulled to the same side. In case of a large pneumothorax or a large pleural effusion, it is pushed to the opposite side. Once you ascertain the position of the upper mediastinum, you should proceed to the apex of the, the heart. You look at the apex of the heart and estimate in relation to the mid-clavicular line whether the apex is shifted or not. Provided the heart size is normal, shift of the cardiac apex indicate the shift of the lower mediastinum. Another important aspect in the palpation of the chest is the reassessing the symmetry of the thoracic movements. For this purpose, you divide the chest into upper, middle and lower and assess the movement in each of these zones separately. You keep your hands like this, bring your thumbs together and ask the patient to take a deep breath. Your hand should be relaxed, should be re so free to move, should be grasping the chest well. Assess the movement of the upper chest, particularly the apices, by keeping your hands on the upper part of the chest. Look at the movements of your thumb. Are they moving symmetrically? You should repeat the same process in the back. But for the sake of the patient's comfort, we usually finish inspection, palpation, percussion and auscultation from the front and then proceed to the back. But for the demonstration purpose, I will show you the testing of the movements from the back. <laughs> 